Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Hi, everybody. This is your good friend, Dr. David Brody, speaking to you live from the North Star Recording Studio here in southern Wisconsin, where it is a balmy 68 degrees. I have the fireplace on over here, as you can see, and it is nice and toasty down here. First of all, thank you for subscribing to the Safety Doc YouTube channel. We have experienced a substantial increase in subscribers over the last few months. So thank you so much for your support. You can find me on Twitter at SafetyPhD. Again, on Twitter at SafetyPhD. Today, we are going to talk about entropy of structures and systems, or what I like to call the new fire engine effect. This is episode 159 of the Safety Doc. And if you go to safetyphd.com, you can find all 159 episodes, including audio, video, and a blog post. Again, safetyphd.com. The most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industry School of Airs, Rethinking School Safety in America, available from Places That Sell Books. It is still um, a bargain, folks. So this book is the truth narrative about school safety. Please consider it. It is in thousands of libraries. So if you're not going to make the purchase, check with your local library. If they don't have it, please encourage them to purchase School of Airs, Rethinking School Safety in America, and add it to their collection. My upcoming book, The Velocity of Information, will release on April 15th, 2022. Again, The Velocity of Information, Human Thinking During Chaotic Times. April 15th, 2022. Hey, it's tax day. Take some of that refund money and invest it in one of the most influential books of modern times. Hard copy, paperback, and ebook will later be released in audio. You can learn more about that by visiting safetyphd.com where the press release for the book is posted. So today, entropy of structures and systems, the new fire engine effect. So I've thought about this one for a while. And to be honest, entropy is a term that I didn't know much about until just a few years ago. What is entropy? It seemed like it was this sciencey term, right? Something that would be in physics or thermodynamics. And actually, yes, it's there, but it also has applications for everyday life, things that we experience. And the part of entropy that became so interesting to me was brought to light after discussion, after an interview with Robert Travis. Robert Travis had two seasons as an Alaskan crab boater. He was a deckhand. And he told me, Dave, you know, one of the things that I'll never forget about being a deckhand, we would be called onto the deck and be told to bring a sledgehammer. And we would have to pound this ice off of the boat because if the ice built up over time and the the boat became too heavy, if it rolled one way or, or it took a nosedive, it could go to the bottom of the Bering Sea. So it was this entropy. The boat over time could degrade. So let's get a a definition of entropy. Entropy is the gradual decline into disorder. An example of entropy is a melting ice cube. So we have our ice cube. Water molecules are fixed and ordered in that ice cube, okay? As that ice cube melts, the molecules molecules become free to move around and they become independent and therefore become disordered. The second law of thermodynamics is that all things lead to entropy. All things eventually reach a state of disorder. 
So we can think of everything that we have around us that's ordered from this phone to this book, everything, this microphone in front of me will reach a state of disorder. Even though these things are ordered right now, they eventually will reach a state of disorder. This entropy, everything will reach a state of disorder. So in this episode, I'm going to examine entropy. I think it's fascinating. And it's um, something I want I, I want you to think about too. And, and as you are observing things every day in your lives, like what do you see for entropy? What is happening in your life for entropy? Entropy of structures, entropy of systems. Uh, this is one of those things I wish somebody would have taught me years ago, years ago, or brought my awareness to it. But I'm thankful right now that uh, it's something that I know more about and I'm excited to talk about it today. So I'm going to use an example once we get more into this, and it's about a small village replacing a 30-year-old fire engine and how that has to do with entropy of structures and also entropy of systems. So let's talk about entropy of structures. So over time, cars will rust. Pavement will crack and the human body will deteriorate. Although entropy of structures is a certainty, preventive measures and maintenance will slow the rate of entropy. For the car, we can wash it. We can wax it. We can keep it out of the elements. If there's a chip on the hood, we can use touch-up paint so it's not exposed to the elements and it's less likely to rust. So we can do things to delay entropy. Exercise staves off muscle atrophy. So as we get older, if we exercise, if we eat well, we can counter the effects of entropy on the human body. And we think about those roads too, right? We can, we can patch up roads. We can prevent water from getting in between those cracks and freezing and thawing and expanding and breaking the road into chunks. We can do that. But that just buys us time. It's never a permanent fix. Um, even if all of the structures, everything on Earth, all of these structures, if they were somehow immune from entropy, if this stainless steel faucet would never degrade this diamond and so forth, all of it. Um, the sun would eventually go nova, right, and engulf everything and cause disorder, and everything would be consumed. And we would have the state of order become a state of disorder. So in the big picture of things, maybe over billions of years, things would eventually come to a state of disorder. So seems like that's kind of a disheartening concept. Um, but no, it's just to become aware of entropy in systems. And there are many things we can do to interrupt entropy. And there are times when we need to recognize entropy in systems and say, this system no longer does what it needs to do for us, or the structure no longer needs to do what it, it does. So... Should we refurbish it? Should we replace it? So we'll get into that, what, what these things mean with entropy. And sometimes we don't acknowledge entropy and we just pretend that it doesn't happen and we start to function in systems which are no longer current or no longer serving our needs. So we just talked about the entropy of structures, the cars rust, pavement cracks, our muscles atrophy. We also have entropy of systems. When the Texas power grid failed in the winter of 2017, a forensic analysis revealed that the power grid system had become old. It was outdated. It was inefficient. Texas had increased in population. It had developed. And then the grid simply, the system of the grid wasn't efficient anymore. You know, remember when you were in elementary school and participated in a monthly fire drill? 
the purpose of the drill was to ensure fidelity of the evacuation system, right? So if you would have only participated in a fire drill the first week of school, then some students would have forgotten the protocols as the year went on. What happens if the fire alarm is pulled in March and the last time you practiced was the first week of September? Would you remember which exit you were supposed to go out of? The protocol, lining up, all of those types of things. So entropy of systems, right? If we just think about our own computers, entropy of systems, needing to update our operating systems, need to put in patches uh, that these systems over time become outdated. They experience entropy. So the example I'm going to use today to talk about entropy is the new fire engine effect. And I encourage you to post below in comments. I'll respond. Post what is something that you observe for entropy, either in structure or systems, and you think would make a great discussion topic. Um, please let me know about that. How do you observe entropy in your own lives? Also, again, please subscribe to this channel. Share it, click that, click that notification so you know when this show is on. Typically it's Monday nights at 8.15 and then also Friday mornings for Face Validity Fridays, 9 a.m. Central Time on Fridays. So the new fire engine effect. Wow, let's talk about this, the new fire engine effect. So up in front of me here, I have a few fire engines. So I'm gonna bring one out and bring it on bring it on screen right now so yeah this is this is one of my fire engines in my collection so this is uh from the 1950s right here so <laughs> remarkable this um this fire engine wasn't nearly as expensive as the modern ones which we're going to talk about in just a moment of about 400,000 for a reasonable fire engine this one maybe was about 20,000 the time that that it was purchased fully equipped probably even less than that so but yeah, the new fire engine effect. So let's just kind of put this fire engine in our mind right now. And what we are going to do is imagine that this fire engine is being replaced. So that this fire engine has served its community very well for the past 30 plus years, but it's time to replace it. So we're gonna talk about entropy and replacing this fire engine. So I'm gonna put this one back in the station down here. All right. In October of 2021, the village board of a community of 1,500 people in Wisconsin approved an expenditure for a new fire engine. At $400,000, the rescue pumper would be the costliest purchase in the village's 2022 budget. The volunteer department's fire chief was grilled by the city council members to justify the large expenditure. The chief was ready. The fire department anticipated that it would need to be updating its equipment. It would need to cycle out this fire engine. So this wasn't anything that was unanticipated, but still when you are looking at a sticker shock of $400,000, the most expensive purchase for that year for a small town, it, it stands out. And even though a fire engine typically serves a community for 30 years, and you amortize it over 30 years, the value of that it still is, it's a big sticker shock. So you have to be ready to justify, you have to explain. And part of this involves entropy. So the fire chief was very well prepared. He talked about the village's primary engine, that 1990 pumper that the village bought new for $78,000. It was well-maintained and it was also succumbing to entropy of structure and systems. In other words, the engine itself was demonstrating fatigue. It was difficult to find replacement parts for the aging apparatus. So something with a fire engine is over time with all of the weight that is put on the frame and then also every call that that fire engine has made, every practice run that it has made, Moving so much weight puts a lot of strain on these 
frames and the various components of the fire engine. So they do start to to weaken um, the, the structures um, aren't as as tight, aren't as robust as they were when they're new. So even though it, it doesn't have a lot of miles on it, right, and the engine is is still you know functioning, the parts of this fire engine continue to age. And it does have a lot of wear, especially this community was built on a hill, a pretty steep hill. So part of the time when this fire engine would go out to calls, it would be either ascending or descending this very steep hill, which would put additional strain on it. But yet the department took very good care of this truck. It had been refurbished a few times, uh, modernized, things like that. But there's something else. It's something bigger. So this fire truck was was built in 1989 and delivered in 1990. The outside world had evolved 30 years beyond when that engine had entered service. Think about that. Back in 1989, when people were working on this engine, nobody had a smartphone. Uh, people had, had Walkman radios. You didn't have GPS in vehicles. You didn't have rear backup cameras. So going back to the time, the world that this vehicle entered, this apparatus entered, was much different than what we have today. So this is important to consider this. The outside world had evolved 30 years. Even if that fire engine never left the station once, if it had been brought there, delivered, put in the fire station, it never left once. The outside world is not static. It's dynamic. Everything is changing around. So that fire apparatus has to be able to adjust to that outside environment. And at some point, it probably isn't going to be able to morph itself anymore. It's going to, to reach a maximum capacity where it just doesn't match. It doesn't mesh with that outside environment. So let's say that a brand new 1990 fire engine could somehow magically be delivered to this fire department. Would that make sense? Well, maybe. The firefighters would certainly be familiar with the apparatus. They would know how to operate the pumps, kind of know the nuances of it. It would be familiar. All the levers, all the controls, right? So with that, you could say, yeah, you wouldn't have to train. We wouldn't have to learn this this new apparatus. We've, we've got this other one figured out. Hmm, okay. Well, you know, going back to that 1990 engine, it it doesn't have a crew cab, and therefore only two firefighters can travel in it most of the time. And you can get three. You can have somebody in the center, but it's not the safest. But let's say you can have three firefighters travel in it. Well, <laughs> It's interesting because when that 1990 engine entered the fleet, it replaced a truck from the 1950s. And back then, firefighters could ride on the back of a truck. So you could have a fire truck leave and you could have two firefighters in the cab and another three or four riding along the back. But let's again, let's think about this 1990 fire engine. It has a crew cab, so it has three firefighters that can transport to a fire. Because of that limitation, though, the, the engine always needed a companion, as the department sent at least four firefighters to a call. This meant that two fire trucks were sent to accidents in order to have sufficient personnel. You know, that was an accepted practice back in 1990. In fact, the firehouse was often emptied for most calls as the mindset was to bring as many assets to an incident as possible. Today, though, the industry standard is different. You know, the protocol is to send a single rescue engine specifically built to respond to accidents. That will have a extended cab, usually can transport four to five firefighters. And it also has extrication gear, kind of the jaws of, of life 
all of that equipment is is designed into this piece of equipment. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. Remember that stalwart 1990 engine? It was state-of-the-art at the time. It was fascinating. When it arrived at the fire department, it was a big deal for that small town. They announced it. It was in spring, again, of 1990. And the townspeople turned out when this, this truck arrived. And they were in awe because it was the first big city truck that this department had. Um, it had a, a large pump on it. it it had a water cannon it was significant for this village to have this this piece of equipment it substantially increased their fire fighting capability so it was pretty remarkable when it became dusk the fire chief flipped the switch and both sides of that fire engine lit up so you could see the ladders on both sides, which was pretty awe-inspiring. And then the panel in back of the cab where the firefighters would stand and be able to adjust the, the pumps. So it was pretty spectacular. The community people were handing out uh, hats. Firefighters were handing out these baseball hats that had the name of the company that had made the, the fire engine. They sent these, these hats along. And they also used the water cannon and hooked the fire truck up to a hydrant and they were spraying thousand gallons of water into the air with this this water cannon. So everybody was was impressed and it it was impressive. So a thousand gallon pump, this 1990 engine. But the new engines, the ones that are built today, they're outfitted with a 1,500 gallon per minute pump. It's significantly more powerful. The village's fire rating actually fell over the, the years. In 1990, it increased, meaning that people paid less for fire insurance because of this increased pumping capacity. It went from 500 gallons on the 1950 pumper to 1,000 on the new 1990 vehicle. But pretty soon, again, as as the industrial park flourished, as there were more residential homes in town, as the footprint of that village expanded, the fire rating fell because there just wasn't enough pumping capacity. So what happened is that it was also prompting a review of the city's fire department. Do we need to have more pumping capacity? So again, this, this new truck that would be purchased, this, this new engine, I should say, would have a 1,500 gallon per minute pump, replacing that 1990 version, which had 1,000 gallons. So we have some entropy here. We have some changes in systems and, and expectations. So something that was, was designed for a system that it matched a small town, not a very big industrial park, not many homes, that had changed, right? That had had over time. And, and this vehicle was no longer matching those needs, the capacity of this vehicle. And then there's this entropy, right, of structure and systems where we can look at the vehicle was never designed to have GPS. GPS screens, computers, laptops built into it, um, cameras, 3D cameras around it. A communication systems built into it so you could talk from the cab to 
firefighters who were at different parts of this apparatus and uh, the sides by the pump panel or, or in back. LED lighting. Who could have imagined that in 1990? So being able to light up the scene better, have this vehicle, have the cabinets, everything lit up better, and so on. All these improved designs. And in addition, the ladders would no longer be stored on the side of the vehicle, built into it, taking up space for extrication equipment. They could be stored up above and easily released and brought down for firefighters to access. So we have this, again, structure entropy of things. You know, the next part is systems entropy. In 1990, nobody thought about extinguishing an electric vehicle unless you were, I guess, thinking about extinguishing the DeLorean from Back to the Future, but it wasn't part of a firefighter's training. Equipment didn't have to be specialized to have different foaming agents and different attachments to fight electrical, uh, electrified vehicles, right? So this is something too, like the systems, the types of vehicles, um, fire trucks back then were designed for structure fires, homes, industry, and also to respond to typical vehicle, internal combustion engine vehicle accidents. So again, in 1990, as these firefighters trained, none of them were thinking someday, someday we're going to be using this apparatus when we respond to put out a fire on an electric vehicle. So the fire apparatus wasn't designed for that. And even if you retrofit it, if you could add things to it, it was still difficult to modify it into a vehicle, which could then be used to fight these electric fires. So firefighters, they train differently today, right? Than their 1990 counterparts. If they could go back and watch their 1990 counterparts, how they would train, they'd be like, whoa, that is so, that's so different. A big part of the 1990 training in this community actually was how to put out chimney fires because a lot of people still heated their homes with wood. And if you heat it with cheap wood, such as spruce or pine, that tarry substance would get into the chimneys and start chimney fires. Something very rare, actually where the community's fire department was not responding to those types of calls anymore. There was a change in that system, that structural system of how individual fire departments uh, would, would battle any blaze. You wouldn't call in additional fire departments if there was a, a building on fire in your town or if there was a barn fire, you pretty much took that on as your own department. Sometimes you might call for assistance from a neighboring department, sometimes. In that particular city, just the year before this fire engine arrived, this new 1990 fire engine, there was a substantial fire downtown in one of the 100-year-old brick buildings. And the fire department called in the fire department from the neighboring small rural town. And between the two of them, they had their old 1950s and 60s equipment duking it out with this, with this fire so again, that was just kind of the approach back in the day. This, this system was to fight the fire on your own and possibly call in another department if you absolutely needed to. But today, that system isn't around. It's such a fire, such a big fire on a main street that would activate what's called mutual aid. That's where fire departments from multiple communities come in and, and help out. And part of the benefit of that is just simply having more firefighters to rotate in and out. They wouldn't be completely fatigued and drained by battling a fire for 10 or 12 hours. So again, mutual aid is something that changed. This whole, this whole system had experienced entropy of 
this really organized system of one fire department had a territory that they would address fires in that ter territory and they would sell them, call in other support. Um, that system fell out of favor for what's called mutual aid. And that's relying quickly on other departments to come in and to support you. So it's actually a very good model, but it's different, right, than what it was in 1990. So with the advent of mutual aid and then also getting people to accept mutual aid, getting the firefighters, the fire departments to accept this mutual aid. Once that was done, fire departments started to streamline their fleets. Instead of having two tankers, two tanker trucks, tenders, water tenders, maybe they just needed one because they could rely on the neighboring communities to respond with their, their equipment. Maybe instead of every department having a ladder truck, only one department in an area needed a ladder truck because they weren't called on very frequently. So they could streamline their fleets and they could also pool their assets if there was a larger fire event. And what they were also realizing was there was only so much you could do on some of these fires. You could largely wait for them to just burn themselves out. Um, bringing more apparatus onto the scene might not benefit the situation. So a lot of changes happening over that 30 year span. So here we are, we have this fire with this new fire engine, which is being purchased and $400,000, the biggest expenditure. And the chief makes the argument of saying things have changed, right? Things have changed. And first of all, can we use this? Can we continue to use this engine? People would ask that this 1990 engine, it's given us 30 years of of great service, can we continue? Well, at a cost, right? We can, we can invest in this, we can restore it maybe to its original self, which would be very expensive to do. Uh, we can refurbish it, which would bring it up to some modern standards, you know, kind of bolt on some of the modern devices, the technology, equipment, things like that, um, to go along with the original we could do that. Uh, it's also going to be costly. It was never designed to have these modifications in the first place. But yes, that could be done. Or we could just replace it, saying this vehicle will reach a point of entropy. No matter how much we put into this vehicle, the frame will continue to fatigue. Every time that vehicle goes out, there'll be a little more entropy. With every day that goes on, there'll be a little more entropy in the materials of this vehicle. There'll be some, some wearing down just by the pure age of the vehicle. So there comes this point when you look at it, and even though it served you well, you've had it repainted, you've had the rust addressed, you've replaced the tires. It's still a 30 plus year old fire engine. It has a smaller pump than what a new fire engine would have. It doesn't have the safety features. It doesn't have the communication systems and so on. It doesn't interface well with the outside world. So we look at that and say, hmm, it's hard to let go of something like that. But once you realize entropy of the vehicle itself, of that fire apparatus, and entropy of, of the systems and changes, it's different, right? Because it, it really didn't make sense to restore it. It would have been cost prohibitive trying to find the parts and something breaks, you have, would have to try to find this part and pay a high cost for it or have it machined or something like that. You could refurbish it, but again, you just would still have an old aging vehicle with some newer parts to it, some newer features. So the sensible approach was to say, when we bought this, we expected that it would give us 30 years of service. And then two things would happen after that 30 years. One, the vehicle itself would fatigue. 
we would identify at that point fatigue points in the vehicle, the frame and the mechanicals and the electrical. If these things these things would would fatigue. And then also the outside world would change. And this vehicle built for entering the world of 1990. Again, the Walkman radio, portable radio world, the world when the firefighters' most prevalent call during the cold months was actually to residential homes to clean out their chimneys because there had been a chimney fire. In that world, in the world before electric vehicles, in the world before very common mutual aid of calling upon other departments, in a world where when there was a fire call, everyone that responded to the fire department, and back then it was a call that came in over their rotary phones at their homes, and their phones would ring, and they would get down to the fire department, and everybody who arrived as a firefighter, you would take out every piece of equipment you had because the thought was the more, the more firefighters, the more equipment, the better off you'd be. You could never have enough equipment at a scene. Maybe there would be something that you'd need. But that changed. And this development of streamlining vehicles and the rescue pumper, and maybe we don't need to carry so much water on every vehicle because it really isn't a farm community anymore. In 1990, there were a number of rural farm, you know, where you'd have a barn fire. And when this vehicle entered service, that was still pretty common, but it's not common anymore. So again, so much had changed from that 1990 to now. And just think in 30 years how things might progress. I was reading an article that indicated uh, drones would be a a huge part of firefighting within the next 10 to 20 years. That instead of firefighters needing to approach a scene, they would get so close with their equipment and then basically control it remotely to extinguish a fire. And actually this vehicle would be this new vehicle, this $400,000 vehicle, would have cameras in front and back and be able and radar to identify how close it is to other structures. But it would also come equipped with a, with a drone, with an area to house its, its drone. That's just common right now. And again, thinking back to 1990, when this, this other stalwart vehicle had been received and put into service, who would have thought that contemporary firefighting 30 years from now, you could have a drone the size of my hand and it would be released from your fire engine and inside you'd have a, a flat screen. Remember those CRT TVs back in the 1990s? But imagine now this, this new fire engine has this flat screen and you can survey around a emergency scene and identify where you need to put your resources. Imagine that for a barn fire or for a car accident. It is invaluable information to have. And these are all things that can be integrated and will be integrated with this new apparatus. A must read for parents, teachers, and taxpayers. Dr. David Perodin has written the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industrial complex. Attorney James Sibley proclaims, a brave demonstration of speaking truth to power, School of Errors rips the lid off the billion dollar school safety industry. Using real world examples of successful responses in desperate situations, David contrasts the expensive window dressings pitched to panic parents with the inexpensive and effective approaches proven to actually work. Read this book before you let your school waste another precious dollar on meaningless safety theater. Buy the international bestseller, School of Errors, 
Rethinking School Safety in America, now at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. So I also think about what does this mean for school safety? A lot of my work is centered on school safety. What does entropy of structures and systems mean for school safety? Well, again, entropy happens very slowly. And part of entropy is that it's hard to recognize when it's happening because you have to have points along the line. Like for this fire engine, you need it to know that fire engine in 1990 to understand the entropy that that fire engine has encountered over the last 30 years. The rust spots, which surfaced and were dealt with and other reconditioning of pumps and repainting the back of the fire engine so it was compliant with the new high visibility rules of emergency apparatus and, and so forth. So you need this big picture, this big sampling of data over time. But that is tricky to come by in schools. In schools, we have a high rate of turnover with administrators and with teachers and staff. You know, if you're a school administrator, maybe two years, maybe three at most, and then you're on to somewhere else. So you don't really see the entropy. You see the safety system in the school as it is when you arrived and you can possibly identify a change from that to when you leave, which might be two or three years later. So it doesn't change much in that time, just what your reference points are. If you're a teacher, that might be a little bit longer, three, four, five years. But again, teachers are leaving, going to other districts or leaving the profession. So this whole thought of the, this veteran knowledge, this legacy knowledge where people have been there a long time and, and they can look at your safety systems, how you're doing drills, how you're conducting drills, the safety of your playground, the accessibility of your... Um, for example, your exits over time and where your fire extinguishers, your AEDs are located and just all of these things that have to do with safety, right? All of your safety structures, all of your safety systems, they understand that over time. Are you still drilling with fide fidelity? Are you still having a monthly fire or safety drill or is that something that's kind of gone by the wayside has experienced entropy in the last year when the pandemic forced a lot of schools to close. So they weren't doing drills. They weren't in person. Now that schools have come back in person, many schools have, are they still conducting the same level of drills? Are they still assessing them? Or would you identify there's entropy? We're not, we're not doing this as much or as robustly as we did in the past. And I would, I would argue that in a lot of instances that that is the case, that we aren't doing our drills and exercises at, at the same level that we were just a few years ago, that the system itself for that is, has experienced entropy because of this disruptive event of the pandemic. So as a safety expert, what what can, what can I do? So I'm not trying to um, have a district contact me and I'm, I'm not trying to use this to um, be a pitch for business. But if I were to look at a district, I would want to understand the best I could of the systems that were in place five years ago, 10 years ago, and the evidence to support those systems, whether it be handbook, documentation, interviewing people, then trying to figure out how those systems have changed, and then also how the outside, how the world has changed, how education has changed. For example, 30 years ago, we didn't have students learning remotely. That was crazy, right, to, to think about that. I, 30 years ago, um, we, were, we didn't have internet in schools. But now remote learning is a big part of education. So whether it be full remote or whether it be part remote. So as we look at our systems too and the way that we put together our safety systems, our drills and exercises, are we still under the assumption that 
we're doing these for staff and students who are in the buildings every day, in the brick and mortar buildings. You know, something else with that is we have 4K community sites, four-year-old kindergarten. 30 years ago, that wasn't a thing, and now it's prevalent. So we have to think about our community sites and how do we do drills? How do we do exercises with fidelity for students who might just participate two days a week or three weeks or three days a week in school or might have one semester where they're learning remotely and another where they're learning in person. So our systems, they change. We have entropy and we have to either then restore that. So would we restore it to every month we are going to do this drill? Here's what we're going to observe. Here's what we're going to measure. Here's what we want to accomplish. Here are our objectives. Or do we want to refurbish it of saying, well, we need to add some modern aspects to this because maybe now we need to also have a phone app because that's, again, prevalent. People have phones, so maybe we will have a phone app. People will receive students and staff communication about what's going on and, and updates and maybe even some GPS features on that. But we need to update. We need to kind of refurbish. We're still going to do this, but we're going to add these, these other components to it. Or do we need to replace things altogether? Do we need to look and say, the way that we're doing drills, the way that we're doing exercises, um, made sense. It matched the 1990s, but it doesn't match right now. Do we have to reconfigure these exercises? Um, so the, all of those questions, do we, do we restore? Do we try to come back to original? This is how we, this is how we did it. This is, this is how we did it 30 years ago. We deem that that's still appropriate, so we need to restore. We need to get, we need to restore back to that. Or again, refurbish. We're going to do this plus some contemporary things. We're adding in phone notifications in case of um, crisis situation. Or do we just replace? Do we replace all of that and evolve to a different system matching that context? So these are the questions which have to be asked. So entropy does put these three questions out in front of us, right? The three questions are, do we restore the structures or the systems, right? Do we, do we restore them? Trying to bring them back to the point of when we put them into force and then at that point, they would have matched the situation in context. So it's kind of like going back in time, right? We're trying to restore it. Think of, think of, you know, an old vehicle, right? <laughs> and you're working and working and working, trying to restore this Model T or, or Model A Ford, you know, to it, when it originally was, was out. But then you have to think, right? So, okay, we have a Model T, but it doesn't have um, taillights and blinkers, which are required. So we'd have to do that. And if it's Model A, it doesn't go fast enough to run on a highway. So we'd have to put in a high gear. And I mean, uh, safety stuff and all these other things we'd have to put in a seatbelt and so, okay, but restore. The other part is refurbish. And there's a lot that can be done of, of main, retaining what is there and then modernizing parts of it. So you still have it couple with what is, what is happening today. It's still relevant, right? That hap that can happen. And there's also a point where you have to identify, is it best to replace this? With that example of the fire engine, for example, it was best to replace it. Sure, you could spend a lot of money and a lot of time that you'd have to have that vehicle out of service in order to restore it, to basically turn it back into that 1990 fire engine that was brought to town and the townsfolk came out and marveled at kind of this nostalgia, this, this uh, being enamored with, with this technology, right? You could do that. You could also refurbish it. You could modernize it the best you could. 
Um, you could figure out where you're going to get a screen, the compartment that's going to hold the drone, or if there's some additional compartment that could be bolted or welded onto it. You could figure out those types of things, right? That could be done. Or do you look at everything and say, again, it's a lot. For what it would cost to purchase this new vehicle, what we would it be investing in this old vehicle? For time and money, when that vehicle, every vehicle, every apparatus continues to have entropy, the new one will too. The old one, it will just kind of exacerbate. It will show up more and more. So you might gain yourself some years, but is it worth it? So that village did decide to go ahead with that purchase of a new $400,000 rescue pumper. And again, this entropy of structures, this 30-year-old this engine which had served them well, it just was time to re replace it. It was wearing out. Even though a fire engine in a small community never has a lot of miles on it, becomes obsolete, the parts age, the pump seals crack. All of that weight, all of the, every gallon of water on that truck weighing eight pounds, all of that weight just sitting, the gravity pulling down, the stress on the suspension of the truck, the stress on the frame, everything just pulling on that that vehicle. So entropy, entropy. So I'm interested to read, to respond, to learn about how you have observed entropy in your life, how you see it. You might say, I have entropy in my home, right? There's a, there's a pane of glass that is cracked or the, you know, the shingles are now starting to curl up and, and starting to wear. And hey, it was a, it was a really good, uh, really good roof 15 years ago, but something has to be done with it pretty soon or there's going to be water leaking in the house. And if that happens, then we're going to have damage into some of the wood supports and the drywall and everything else. And this entropy, right? Just as if we hadn't maintained the house. If we just left the house over time, the yard would grow up and parts of the house would just start to, to fail, right? Faucets would, would leak. Um, things would fall on the house, cause some damage, tree limbs, other debris, just because no one's around to, to take care of it. So we're in this constant effort of working to counter entropy. It's the same thing, right, with, with our cars. Every time I'd, I'll take my vehicles out and a warm summer day, get out the car wash, uh, suds up the, the vehicles and, and clean them off, wash them, identify where the new chips of paint are from <laughs> the rocks and you know, try to clean those up and, and use the touch-up paint to prevent rust or at least to, to slow it down, right? To slow down entropy. And then I'll wax, put it on that protective layer to keep the sun from fading the paint, keep the road salt from where I'm at of eating away. And I'm gaining some time. I'm slowing that entropy process down by doing that, but not halting it. And even if I did none of that, even if the vehicle sat in the garage with the door down, eventually the tires would go flat. The seats would get crinkly, right? As you're the leather would not uh, would become would crack. You would notice anything that was vinyl would start to have cracks. 
warps, things like that. The battery would go dead. The gas in the tank wouldn't, would turn sour. It wouldn't work anymore. So even if you did nothing, right, entropy would happen to the vehicle. And of course, entropy and fitness is probably one of the biggest things to also think about and, and to, to make this real, right? That as we, if we don't work out, if we, if we aren't physically fit, if we aren't eating healthy, our bodies start to reflect that. And as we just age, we start to lose flexibility and these other things. So we can counter that with working out. We can counter that with a better diet. But everybody gets to a point when entropy is very evident. Everybody has a wall that they hit. Every system has a wall. Every structure has a wall. The wall takes them all. So identify where these states of entropy are in your life. And I think there's entropy, of course, in personal relationships. Identifying making your neighbors, your friends, making sure that you're staying in contact with your networks, your member check, your networks. People are going to give you the feedback that you're seeking, the validity, the face validity checks, but you need to invest in that. If you don't do that, those systems will fall apart. People won't be able to sample their environments and tell you what they're observing as efficiently as when they were doing it on a regular basis and receiving feedback from other people in their member check network. So again, we can see entropy in systems if we look for it, but we often don't look for it because we only see things at the one point in time. If you came down here right now and you were in this office, you would be, wow, you know, there's a, you have a nice wood floor in here and temperature is really good. You've got your fireplace and these lights. This is really a nice studio. I'd say, thank you. I appreciate that. But you also didn't ever sample this studio before. You don't know the entropy of the studio. You don't know that there was 20 year old deteriorating carpet in here up until this summer that there were old LED lights in here that were replaced with or old uh, fluorescent lights replaced with LED um, that this office didn't have this fireplace in the background before. So it was very cold and chilly down here. And, and this, this kind of entropy is the, again, the carpet had, had worn out. The lighting was, was inconsistent down here. So I had addressed that entropy. So entropy. Well, I want to thank you for supporting the safety doc. Again, safetyphd.com is my website. You can find every show that I've recorded. Also a blog post of 5,000 characters, about 800 words to go with every show. Shows are rendered in audio in addition to video. All audio is leveled and that can be found again at safetyphd.com. Hey, if you got a road trip going, download and listen. If you are interested in the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industry, it is right here. School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America. Make this part of your collection. Or if your local library doesn't have this, let them know. Say, please add this to your collection. If you are a parent, this is essential reading to understand how school safety works in your environment. If you are a taxpayer, it is essential reading to understand how billions of dollars are spent on school safety. And are those things necessarily making schools safer or in some instances not? Which I argue in chapter 28 about bollards in front of schools. My new book, The Velocity of Information, Human Thinking During Chaotic Times, releases on April 15th, 2022. You should be able to pre-order that soon on Amazon and other places that sell books. This has been the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio show host, and leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Remember to check back each week for the latest 
best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. You can find Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.